All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing time so far. Our next speaker is Jay Willis. He is a senior corporate counsel at Bristol Myers Squibb. Please join me in welcoming Jay to our virtual stage. My name is Jay Willis, and as Patricia said, I am senior corporate counsel at Bristol Myers Squibb, and I'll be talking to you today about healthcare AI considerations in the intellectual property spectrum. Just to give you a little bit more about my background, I've also been a patent counsel at Novartis Pharmaceuticals, Santa Fe Pharmaceuticals. I had my own patent law firm in Washington State where I counseled clients on computer-related interventions. I'm gonna to go to my slides now. So as I said, I'm talking about healthcare-related artificial intelligence systems. And what I would first like to convey is that there are two subjects I will discuss today. One is the types of intellectual property protection you might seek for your business interests, which would be copyright, trade secrets, and patents. And then separately, how you negotiate those rights with your clients or providers. Firstly, I talk about copyright. Copyright provides protection for fixed works. Those fixed works, for example, could be your program code. It could be works of authorship, it could be copy from a public relations firm that you use in training patients on your devices or systems. And copyright protection actually is available to the creator of a work such as a program code, but without federal registration. However, most and many people do seek federal registration with the Library of Congress because it helps you to assert your rights against potential infringers. It does, however, require that you publicly disclose your code and register that with the Library of Congress. If you're not agreeable to that and you don't want to disclose the code, then you might seek some of the other protections that I'll talk about later. The protection of your code is that code without significant modification. And I'm using code as an example of a work that might be protected. Of course, there are other types. So if something is substantially or strikingly similar to your work, then it could be infringing. And a court would determine that if you sought to sue an infringer. So you gain some exclusive rights to your code by registering for copyright. However, there are some limitations. The fair use doctrine says that in some instances, the entire work that you created could be incorporated by others in some instances. For example, in criticism, teaching. Uh, for example, in this talk, I have used an image that you see on this page that I attribute, but which has also been freely available to anyone to use off the internet. And I'm also using it for fair use, use, which is that it is for teaching purposes. Opposite to that, there are instances where small portions that could be incorporated into others' work may alone be infringing. So we have the opposite ends of the spectrum, one where the entire work has to be incorporated or substantially the entire work, and another one where a small piece could be incorporated and still be infringing. And that is whether that small piece really is the kernel, the heart of your work. And in your code, for example, you may see that a section which you feel is the most important part of it has been taken, and that is really what you're upset about. For example, I'm gonna give a, a rather uh, broad one here, here we have an image of cicadas used as a flavor enhancement in chocolate cookies and also in chocolate candy. Would one say that a chocolate recipe that is um, a chocolate candy recipe, would that infringe on a copyrighted cicada cookie recipe? So in other words, one is a cookie, one is a candy, but they both use cicada as a flavor enhancement. So is the actual idea here that the copyrighted interest is not so much whether it is a cookie or a candy, but that the cicada as the flavor enhancer is the heart of the protected work. So in this case, you might be able to argue that there's a copyright infringement on the recipe. This is something as a broad or a rough example you could use to identify the kernel of your heart of your protected work. Next, I'll talk about trade secrets. Trade secrets are an area of intellectual property protection that utilizes a written agreement between parties to ensure that the technology or know-how or information that's supposed to be secret is in fact maintained as secret. It's information that should not be published 
And the agreement is enforceable against anyone who discloses that without approval. However, there are some things that limit the effect of trade secrets. It's great when you have a small number of people who have that limited information. For example, the Coca-Cola recipe has been protected for over 100 years because a small number of people have had access to that particular recipe. But if you had a large number of employees with high turnover in your particular business, then the trade secret agreement, while enforceable, might be hard to police. Patents are the third area of protection I'm going to talk about. They provide protection for novel and non-obvious inventive concepts. So for example, if you had an idea that was not strictly verbatim, you know, we gave an example, I gave an example of copyrights before. Copyrights protect a fixed work. However, patents are broader than that. They provide a bit more wiggle room and protect a concept which can be slightly different in different claims that you have in a patent. Patents are of great interest to many people because uh, folks think they obtain exclusive rights. And as a matter of fact, a lot of private equity investors ask if you have patents that protect your business. Private equity investment, as a matter of fact, for AI startups represents 12% of worldwide private equity investments in 2018 uh, and has increased since that time. So it's an important area to be considering. However, be aware of the limitations of some of that protection. You must disclose the details of your invention to obtain a patent. It's not immediately disclosed as with copyright. There is an 18 month secrecy period that allows you to gain funds, to examine and prosecute your patent applications, decide in which countries around the world you wanna file patent applications. But then 18 months after you file, it will be published. If you can't stomach the 18 month publication period and you still wanna keep it secret, and you can maintain the number of people who have that information, trade secret may actually be more valuable to you, particularly if you have a short-lived technology that you continually evolve. And you should explain that to your equity investors. Protection also can be narrow sometimes. In the area of AI and ML type improvements in healthcare, there's a lot of work going on with wearable devices, devices that take data and then transfer it into a diagnosis or some sort of adverse event monitoring in patients. And so there's a lot of overlapping subject matter that's been patented. So you could have ultimately a narrow patent. However, a benefit, regardless of how broad it is or narrow it is, is that it could protect your core business so that no one could patent by chance your invention and then sue you on what you market. So it at least will give you freedom to operate. Patentability of your invention then depends on what it does. If it's program code, it's very difficult to patent per se. Algorithms typically are not patentable because they are unpatentable subject matter. And I'll talk about that a little bit to come. But if you have a processor system that is transformed by code, then it may be patentable. It, a general rule is if you can perform your process or system without the use of a computer, it's probably not patentable. You should focus on the claims as being an improvement in computers as tools but not so much in independent abstract ideas that use computers as tools. So for example, in your patent claims, avoid mental steps like receiving or collecting a plurality of data streams, detecting, analyzing, or displaying events, but focus more on the transformation of data into some outcome that is able to then transform the, and provide benefits to patients in healthcare industry type patents. So this way you're getting a, uh, an outcome that is a transformational outcome rather than doing something that's a mental step such as analyzing or displaying. Uh, just a note that computer programs as such are not patentable inventions in Europe. In addition, business methods in banking, the banking industry have been a high area of patent uh, deniability by the US Patent and Trademark Office. I'll talk about that also in the healthcare industry because some of these cases that define what is patentable in AI inventions also pertain to healthcare type AI inventions. So there's one particular case, Alice v. CLS Bank, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 2014, which said that there's a two-step process you can use to identify if your concept is a patentable type concept or patent eligible concept. 
do you have something that's actually a patent ineligible concept? For example, an abstract idea, law of nature, mathematical formula. But if they are still, does your system or your claim elements transform that patent ineligible thing into something that is patent eligible? For example, as I said, something that takes data, transforms it into a diagnosis or an outcome that can then benefit patients and or physicians. Another consideration is patent pendency, how long it takes to get a patent versus the life of your technology. And the US Patent and Trademark Office Technology Center 2100, which is the computer architecture, software and information system security center for examination of patents, which also includes AI simulation and modeling. They have an average patent pendency, which is the time you file until the time you either get a patent or you abandon the patent is about 25 months. So a little over two years. In addition, you have the opportunity to file around the world using what's called the World Patent Application or PCT application. You can choose to file in individual countries if you're only interested in certain countries like the US, Japan, and you do have one that's able to file in all of Europe at once. But if you're seeking a multitude of countries, it might be worth your while to seek a world patent application in which you can get on file simultaneously for a fairly small fee, a patent application in over 160 countries. You can then decide over a 30 month period of time to file in any number of those countries, probably not all of them, and to also gain funds to pay for the filing fees, the attorney fees, and the patent examination fees in the patent offices in which you wanna file. But be aware that also adds up to 30 months while you do that. And then examination of your patent will begin after that 30 month period. So we're talking on the order of at least five years if you use that world application route and all the benefits of it. So if your technology has less than five year lifespan, patent might not be what you're particularly interested in. I've created a, a sliding scale on the next slide to identify when a trade secret versus patent might be in your interest. Now remember, trade secret has the opposite requirements of patent. Trade secret requires things to be maintained a secret by agreement. Patent requires that you disclose your invention and that's the trade-off for you to disclose your novel and inventive and key new con contribution to society. The patent office wants you to disclose that. And in return, what they'll give you is a 20 year protection for that so that you could sue others who might be infringing. But then again, if your tech life is less than five years, you might decide to go with trade secret. But if it's more, and you can go through all the hoops and steps to get a patent in the countries you want to, then it's like the patent is more in your interest. If you have also small numbers of people who have access to confidential know-how that you want to protect, trade secret is probably another consideration. However, if there are large numbers of people and you have high turnover, patent is probably more in line with your expectations. If you have an abstract concept, like an algorithm, protect it by trade secret. If it is, however, a system that's subject matter that is patent eligible, please seek patent protection. In addition, ensure if you're seeking trade secret protection to have proper secrecy provisions in place with your subcontractors and contractors. I have here a diagrammatic that shows the example of a system versus code that you might want to protect. In the diamond shaped symbol, I have identified apps or program code that you might want to protect as an example. That typically would be protectable by copyright and or trade secret might not be protectable by patent. And in addition, if you have a whole system that takes data from a patient who is willing and volunteering to give that, put it into an app or interface that's transferred to a data storage system and then filtered, analyzed, decisions that are processed through machine learning type algorithms or reported through a system to an external researcher or clinician who then will use that to treat or diagnose a patient, that whole system is likely more patentable than the diamond shaped box that I've shown here. Next, I wanna to switch to what do you offer to your collaborators or customers? And the reason for this is to discuss how you might negotiate those IP rights that you do obtain through time. Do you provide analyses of biological, chemical, or clinical data, like molecular structure design, clinical data analyses, patient-physician interactions? Do you provide new code for new applications as requested? Or do you provide existing applications for a fee? Do you provide devices that are fixed for a fee? 
or do you provide them modifiable that you're a collaborator? Or do you have a software as a medical device which requires not only an entire system, but also someone to monitor that system to maintain the privacy of patient data and to protect against adverse events in patients, in which you provide people as part of your system, in which case you have a much more complicated sort of agreements and you do need to then monitor how your IP is tracked within those agreements. So what intellectual property rights do you truly value? And what form of agreements do you need? What do you offer to your clients, as I mentioned? Is it a service model? Do you provide a service for a fee or a service that has updates, but typically you own all the rights and everything is conveyed under a user agreement for certain payment? Or have you been asked to create something new as a collaborator, as a de novo type new invention? In which case, you need to track your intellectual property through time continually. And I'm going to show you some examples of how you can track that. So if a customer, first of all, asks you to create something new, or you ask your service provider to create something new, like a new application, device, or system, move away from any master service agreements or statement of work. Because it's difficult to own IP rights where there is existing background technology or improvements to the background technology, or there's newly developed technology or know-how that might be a complicated or a complex of ideas, both old and new. For example, chemical substituent target interaction data. Are you interested in a collaboration to obtain new chemical structures and or the interaction data with a target? I'd assume if you were, for example, an AI drug discovery provider, you'd be interested perhaps in owning the chemical structures or at least having the data that shows interactions at target receptors. And as a pharmaceutical company, for example, who's working with the AI drug discovery company, would you like to own the chemical structures or at least have an exclusive license to them? There's also other types of intellectual property you might want to own. I've seen situations where folks have relied upon an existing master agreement when they were getting a, a service that was typically more of the type that was providing a database type search structure or and then as time evolved, the, the two parties would work together to investigate something new and try to create something new. And as they did that, they relied upon the master service agreement, which had no provisions for the newly developed things that they were working on because they evolved quickly and people were excited. But as soon as you get asked to create something new, move away from that service agreement and try to create an agreement where you can track the rights that are being created, the rights that were old, and improvements to those existing rights. Document the ownership of those IP rights through time in each form of agreement and subagreement. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but it will make things easier. So look at the existing technology, improvements to your background technology, and newly developed technology in your master or master service agreements, in your collaboration agreements, and each statement of work or statement of collaboration that you create or any amendments to those as they occur through time. I have a little inset here in yellow, which shows my and my intellectual property and your type intellectual property recordation or recording. So you would record in each document a chart which shows what is being brought in this particular document or amendment to some other document. You'd include this chart, which would show the existing platform, for example, who owns those particular platforms, improvements to those platforms. In one case, it could be the underlying structure for data analysis. In another case, it could be copy from an advertising firm. And then any specific newly developed technology which is requested either in the agreement or in a statement of work. It could take years to create or modify and to continually evolve what you're working on in a collaboration. And so therefore it makes sense to keep this recordation of your IP rights through time because folks may inherit this through time and the original agreement may longer be entirely relevant to what's new because of the changes. It will of course document who owns ownership of new things directly, but how to identify what is new and what's being created will be aided by creating this sort of chart. So to summarize, 
There are three forms of intellectual property that may be key to you. Copyrights, which require public disclosure and protect a fixed work. Trademarks, which are protection of secrets by agreement and can be benefited when there are a small number of people with that knowledge. And the technology has a relatively short lifespan. Although if you can keep it secret for a long time, like the Coca-Cola recipe, then um, you're well along to using trade secrets to the benefit it ultimately has. And also patents, which protect concepts that are a bit broader than a fixed work. Then once you have those rights, make sure you document them through time in your various agreements. Thank you very much. Wow, great job, Jay. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. This has been awesome. And I know this audience is giving you a huge virtual round of applause. <laughs> For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around. <laughs>